I think uh, many things that we are experiencing and that we are talking about here at TEDx and other editions of it is really a world that is experiencing great change. And uh, of course, I'm supposed to speak about the change in university education, but I feel it's good to get started with some background. And with the great change is actually such that many people who are not in control of this change feel it as a great wave coming at them and breaking over their heads. And I always find that this picture by Hokusai, which is already almost uh, 200 years old, is a very nice expression of that moment frozen in time when something is about to happen. A great thing. And um, this picture also depicts the tension that is there, the tension between potential doom or the challenge of surviving. And I think this is something that, that is in all the institutions that are being challenged by the great changes that are coming. And one essential element is also present in this picture, uh, but it's not so obvious. Um, and it, one of the great motors of change is globalization. The world is becoming a flat world. And it's interesting to know that this picture by Hokusai, which is seen as the essence of Japanese uh, woodblock printing art, in fact itself is a nice product of globalization. First of all, if you compare this picture to other pictures in the older tradition, it has remarkably more perspective, which is something new. And the other thing is why it was very much like, were because they, these were high quality pictures and especially did not have fading blue. And both of these influences actually came to the Dutch, which were the only connection at the time with Japan to the rest of the world. And Hokusai could study European books on art and uh, on perspective. And the blue that's been used was a blue collar only invented 50 years earlier, Prussian blue, which came from Europe. So it's interesting to know that this very Japanese picture, in fact, is an international co-production. OK. So maybe we do not always need the internet, but certainly important changes today are mediated by the networked world. I think, in fact, in some way or another, everybody at, uh, at, at sessions like this is discussing the influences of networks. And, and, and of course, what, what are essential things in the network? Well, first is the huge connectivity. Um, the other is perhaps something which can be exp experienced as if you wish, a threat or a challenge, and that is actually the huge redundancy. Because in the network is very robust to change. And if we're speaking of universities, for example, if you're not very careful, we could just remove any university from the network, and it would be very bad for that university. It would make very little difference to the network. So this means that we are always speaking in this networked world of having added value, if creating something that brings something to the network as a whole. Um, OK, last thing, which really is the agent in the globalization that I just spoke about, is the fact that, of course, the internet allows us to be much more decoupled from time and place than we had in the old days. We can do things at different locations that take effect at the other end of the world, and we could do things at a different time in, uh, than, than they actually have an effect, right? And we've seen this in the world. We've seen the manufacturing industry change by globalization, the services industry, and the next big wave, where, as we speak, is hitting the world of universities. And um, one thing which is very much hyped today in this setting is the world of our consortia and, uh, and enterprises that offer online digital content and, and, and uh, uh, access to, uh, to learning resources. And uh, one of the phrases of the day is those of MOOCs, the Massively Online Open Courseware. And, well, let's say, first of all, there's a tremendously bright side to this. Um, digital content, especially also at the university level, will bring knowledge to very large groups of the global population that have no access to university uh, education today. And uh, that's, of course, a great thing. In fact, we will see in the coming years a global growth of the middle class that will 
um, outstrip our capacity for building universities to educate all of them. So having online education delivered is a very good thing to engage those people in, in academic learning. Um, another thing is networks allow sharing. Um, I do not know exactly how many universities there are in the world, I think, uh, but uh, all in all, there are in the tens of thousands. Most of these universities will offer introductory courses to something or other, let's say an introductory course to mathematics for people interested in science. All of them offering their same course. If we could just pool and share the resources, it's very likely, if we cooperate in that way, that the product would be the best thinkable introductory course to mathematics, for that group, and it would enhance quality, and it would reduce cost. In fact, reducing cost is at this moment a very important driver for this development, especially with our North American colleagues, who see here great benefits. Um, it also has to do with improving quality. The interesting thing is, I just learned the other week that students from Harvard are actually following a digital course from Brigham Young University in Utah, simply because it's better than the course that's being offered to them at home. And that's very interesting, because we create resources on the net, they're visible, and where excellence is visible, mediocrity appears. So this is a, a large upside of doing all these things. But there are not only positive developments here. So we see that these are indeed massive courses. I think um, when we're talking about, for example, the Stanford course in artificial intelligence, more than 50,000 people sign up. Right? Um, it also turns out, I don't know for that particular course, but we know about online courses that on the way of developing this course and getting to the end, about 90% drop out. Uh, those are figures that I would not want to present to my ministry. Um, another thing is, there is something about delivery of digital content, but what about didactics? A lot of the online material, although excellently uh, are televised, uh, etc., are a bit like this, somebody talking to an audience or to a computer screen with some uh, slides on the side. That's actually a step back from more engaging didactics, which we think modern education needs. So, is indeed this way of just putting digit material digitalized online the way forward for universities or education at large? Actually, I think that this is an undeniable uh, and an unstoppable development, but it has to be mixed in with other ideas that we need to improve the idea. And those ideas are actually from the past. Let me first specify for what is it actually that we seek to educate. Who, who, who do we want to educate? What, 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 what want we create? What does the modern academic professional look like? And uh, typically, we sum this up as the T-shaped professional. We want somebody who can do really something, has real knowledge. So it's not about just educating skills. There has been a short movement where we said, well, knowledge is everywhere. We don't need to invest in knowledge. You just need the skills to be able to do something with the knowledge. Well, this this movement was uh, 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 soon forgotten because the only way that you can actually acquire skills is by apply applying it to profound knowledge, knowledge that's yours. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Uh, the, the skills evaporate. So this is what we want. But there is really a requirement that is much stronger today than, let's say, uh, if you would ask this question 10, 20, 30 years ago, and that's the broadness of orientation. Um, since we can no longer predict that the people that we educate, where they, what will be the problems that they'll be working on? The dyna dynamism in society is so, such that probably they need to be solving problems that we can't even think of today. So what we need is people that are extremely resourceful and can apply what they have learned also to new areas, new, new problems, etc. So we need this broadness. So let's now get back. I have three slides that I have dubbed Back to the Future. And one is about academic skills. And it's very interesting, I think, that if we go to the roots of it, 
you can find the ideas that are very important to make things work. Um, and that goes back to the founders of the modern universities. And we had one continental, which was Wilhelm von Humboldt. And he is the one that made clear that academic education really has to go hand in hand with doing research. He called this forschendes Lernen, huh? to learn while you are doing, when you, while you're researching, when, while you're inquiring. And the other is John Henry Newman, who also pointed out that what is very essential for academic formation is, is the, the, the presence of an academic community that discusses ideas, that where there is debate, exchange of opinion, and uh, uh, the community. And of course, the point is that academic skills are truly the ones that broaden the knowledge. They are the so-called transferable skills that allow you to apply what you have learned to other domains, to be creative, to be critical, etc. And of course, we need to create ways in our new digital world, or as a context around our digital world, that will make this connection between research and teaching and building a community. A second one that is very important, perhaps more important than ever, if I speak to people on what they want from our students, then, of course, they need to know their thing, etc., but they need to be resourceful and creative and independent, etc. If you ask anyone, huh? and then they can learn things later, so to speak. It's about attitude, and it has to do with the fact, and that will be difficult to put as digital content on the net, is actually to experience learning by doing. I think that was the interesting thing about the film we just saw, about the little bits. It's, it's about the experience. Everything I have really remembered and made part of my person, personal knowledge is knowledge that I have applied. So we need to have, uh, let's say, workshops like the Bauhaus, where people collectively work to solve problems. I think this is a, a strong requirement on the future professional. Last thing I want to mention, it's, it's the networking, but um, I'm thinking of the Middle Ages, actually. Um, and there's this analogy, there is people that thought that digital word processing would bring us the, 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 uh, the paperless office. Instead, it brought us more paperwork, more documents, etc. Therefore, also, I think it's a fallacy to think that if we digitize our academic world, this would take away the need uh, to travel and that we could just sit at home and sort of take in and be educated. The other slides already showing that we need to do something there. But in fact, the, the opposite will be true. Because we get to know people through the networked world, through the social media of academia, we will have more urges, more desire to work together and to visit each other. And um, I can predict that modern academic courses will actually be co-productions between universities, where there will be a course on a specific topic where each university brings a specialized module to this course, and like the Vagantis in the Middle Ages, our students will be going from one place to another to consume, let's say, the speciality at the place where the community of learning on that speciality is there. And of course, it needs to be surrounded with the digital environment that will make that easy and productive. Okay, so to summarize, um, I think the boats in uh, Hokusai's picture were perhaps not moving in the right direction. The big wave of change must be ridden like a surfer, and that means we need to be flexible, and we need to keep our balance. And the balance will be about making good use of everything that technology is bringing us, and it's beyond imagination. We are trying here to imagine it, but we will fall short. I think in 2040, the world will look so different that we cannot even think about how it looks. But we will have to adapt on the way of getting there, and at least the ideas are there. The technology will take us with the digital content and the resources that will be available in a way that we cannot even imagine. And at the same time, we have to use the ideas from the past on intellectual communities, 
on working together and on also networking our courses to move into the paradise that is beyond this wave. Thank you very much.